Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be breaking down 100 Bullets Volume 9. The last volume ended with the death of Joseph Shepard, which creates a huge status quo shift, with Lano now being elevated as Warlord of the Trust. In this volume we will see some of the repercussions of these changes. Let's dive into it. 100 Bullets Volume 9. 100 Bullets, Volume 9, Strict 9 Lives, written by Brian Azzarello, art by Eduardo Riso. 100 Bullets, Issue 59, The Calm. Last volume, Shepard got killed by Dizzy. Dizzy did not mean to kill Shepard, but when she heard the trigger word, Croatoa, and she did not hear it come out of Graves' mouth, all of a sudden she was just programmed to react. Before Shepard died though, he phoned Lano, and he made sure that Lano would be his successor and become the next Warlord of the Trust. With Shepard out of the picture and some of the Trust now dead, the landscape and the allegiances of various characters seem to now have shifted. Here is a breakdown of most of the major characters in 100 Bullets. We see the Trust at the top, and the Minutemen at the bottom, as well as some other characters on the side. So, among the Trust, Daniel Perez is dead. He was killed by Graves and Cole Burns in issue 25. He was killed as some sort of message to the rest of the Trust. Anwar Madrid, he was killed in issue 56 by Wiley Times in New Orleans. Wiley was actually just trying to get to Shepard and Anwar was in his way. Among the Minutemen, Milo Garrett was killed in issue 36 by Lano. Lano did not know it was Milo at the time due to Milo's bandages. And Mr. Shepard was killed in issue 58 by Dizzy. Now among the Minutemen, we seem to have some splintering factions now. Agent Graves and Cole Burns seem to be working pretty closely together. Wily Times and Dizzy were with Shepard when he died, and they too seem to be very stuck together. Although it is hard to tell now if they will lean towards Graves, or they will shift to Lano. Lano, as the new Warlord of the Trust, seems to be very closely tied in with Luke Hughes. And very soon they will connect with Victor Ray the Rain. Beyond them there is Remy Rome and Jack Daw, and both of them are kind of out on their own for now. When this issue begins, Loop and Lano were just recently released from prison. We pick up with them now. We see Loop is driving a car and Lano is in the back seat. They are driving through Chicago. Loop, not impressed with Chicago, says, what is up with this town? Lano answers, Chicago? I caught fire over a hundred years ago and no one's ever bothered to put it out. Loop laughs and says, heh, that's good, deep. Elsewhere across town, we see a man named Wally. Wally is in a bathroom, he has a gun in his hand, and he is working himself up to kill someone. You see, Wally's wife, Christine, left Wally for the Minuteman, Victor Ray. Wally's trying to pump himself up to go through with his murdering plans. He's saying to himself, I'm gonna kill her. I'm gonna kill them both, if you've got the balls. Oh, I got the balls. Big balls, big frickin' blue balls hanging down to my knees. Elsewhere, we jump to a rundown apartment where Victor Ray is getting a blowjob from this Christine woman. Victor Ray, aka The Rain, was a Minuteman we first saw in issue 50, Pray for Rain. We learned that Agent Graves actually woke up Victor way before the events of issue 1 before Graves talked to Dizzy. Victor has kind of been laying low and doing his own thing since then. So Victor and Christine were getting it on, but then eventually, Victor had a knock at his door. When Victor opened the door, Lano and Loop were on the other side. Victor and Lano greet each other warmly and they hug. Victor asks, What the hell have you been doing with yourself, Lano? Lano replies, That's what I'm here to talk to you about. Victor, wanting a little privacy, gives Christine some money and tells her to go down to the store and get them all some drinks. Christine heads out. Victor, he then notices Loop, and he asks Lano who this is. 
Lano says that Loop is the son of Curtis Hughes. We know Curtis from the Hang Up on the Hang Low story arc, which wrapped up in issue 18. Curtis Hughes was almost hired as a Minuteman back in the day, although he was held back because the Trust at that time did not want a black man in the Minutemen. Victor shakes Loop's hand and tells him, Real frickin' pleasure. Back over to Wally, he is in his apartment, still working up the courage to murder his wife, Christine, that ran out on him. Back over to Loop, Lano, and Victor Ray. Loop catches Victor up on what he has been up to. He explains how he was in prison recently, and then Shepard gave him a call and they were sprung the morning after. And among his personal effects when he was released from prison was a key to a safe deposit box in Cleveland. That key is something that Shepard got to Lano. So Lano and Loop checked out this safe deposit box. Inside was an extensive record collection. Lano there was able to look through some files and by doing so, he was able to find out the location of Victor Ray, thus bringing him here. Lano then asks Victor, after Atlantic City, Graves woke you up before anyone else. Has he contacted you since? Victor answers, no. Lano finds that hard to believe, but Victor is adamant that Graves had left him alone. Lano then talks to Loop and says, you see Loop, just like the old man told us. Graves, he was waiting for us outside of prison. And he told us, go get Victor, but be careful. You might not be down with the plan. Lano asks Victor, you having second thoughts, Victor, with the plan? Victor questions what the plan is. You mean taking out the trust? Lano says, no, I mean restoring it, but with one head instead of 13 families. Victor thinks on it and says, yeah, I'm still down with the plan, Lano. Lano to this says, good, then pack your bags and let's go. Victor goes to grab his bag. When while he's in his bedroom collecting his things, the girl Christine arrives back in the apartment. Christine announces herself saying, I'm back, you miss me? Lano then turns to Christine and says, it's funny, I just met you, but yeah, I've been missing you for a long time. Real long. Lano, he then starts moving on Christine. Christine immediately gets uncomfortable. She asks, where's Victor? Lano tells her in the bedroom. I guess that leaves us the kitchen table. It seems like Lano's ready to have his way with this girl. Loop's getting uncomfortable. He says, yo, Lano. Lano tells him, give me a break, son. You'll get yours when she's done with me. Lano grabs Christine's face and says, you got a real set of lips on you, girl. Christine spits in Lano's face. Lano wipes it off and says, nice. They work, but your aim is way high. He then shoves Christine to the floor. Christine getting scared, she yells, Victor, Victor. Victor comes back into the kitchen with his gun. He tells Lano, that's enough. Lano lets Christine go and backs off. Lano then heads outside with Loop to wait for Victor. Once Victor and Christine are alone, Christine asks Victor, Christ almighty, did you see what he was doing? Victor answers, I saw. Christine, she asks, is that all you gotta say? Victor replies, nah, I'm leaving, thanks. Christine asks Victor to give her a call when he gets home, but Victor then breaks it to Christine that this is it for them, he says. I wouldn't count on that occurring, sweets. Christine is distraught, she says, but Victor, I told my husband about us. Of course, her husband is that guy, Wally, that's aching up the nerve to kill her. Victor tells Christine, yeah, well, that was your call, and not a smart one either. Christine replies, but Victor, you said you didn't want this to end. Victor, he just starts walking out. Christine continues, is that all I am to you? A good time? Victor answers, no, I left you some money on the dresser. Victor then heads outside and joins Lano and Loop by their car. They are getting ready to leave. Before they head off, though, we see Wally has finally arrived. He makes his way up to his wife Christine's apartment. When Christine sees Wally, she's crying and she asks, What the hell are you doing here, Wally? Wally pulls out the gun and Christine, trying to save her life, says, Yeah, oh, you, you came to take me back, didn't you? Wally puts a gun to Christine's head. 
Christine says, Oh, I made a mistake. I'll make it up to you. Let me make it up to you. She then starts pleasuring Wally to satisfy him. And Wally, he eventually contemplates still shooting Christine, but then he changes his mind and shoots himself instead. Outside, Victor, Lano, and Loop hear the gunfire blast, but they think not much of it, and they drive off. And after that dark ending, we move on to the next issue. 100 Bullets, Issue 60, Staring at the Sun, Part 1 of 4. We jump to a hotel in Miami. Megan Dietrich arrives. At the hotel, a bellboy named Tino greets her. Tino is going to be an important side character in this story arc. Tino is eager to help Megan because she's attractive, but she's also a good tipper. Once Megan enters the hotel, she meets with Mr. Branch. Megan asked Branch to meet her here. She paid for his airfare, first class, which Branch is not used to, and she also paid for his hotel stay. Branch seems a little reluctant to be here. He asks Megan, look, can we get down to business so I can get out of your cesspool? Megan tells him, later. First, I'm going to get out of these clothes and into the pool. Leave your number with the concierge and I'll contact you. Branch asks, when? Megan answers, when I'm ready. Elsewhere in the same hotel, we see Augustus Medici, Benito Medici, and their bodyguard, Crete. Augustus and Benito just wrapped up a tennis game in which Augustus won. Crete informs them that Megan has arrived. Benito asks his father, what's Megan in town for? Augustus answers, business. Once Augustus towels down, he tells his son, meet me out front in an hour. Back in the front of the hotel, another guest arrives. The guest is a man named Spain. Spain arrives in a fancy looking car. Spain seems like a rock star of some sort. He's got cash, and he's got a little sissy dog with him, kind of like what Paris Hilton would have. The dog is named Cookie. Spain also has his assistant with him, named Terry. When they pull into the hotel, they are greeted by the bellboy, Tino, whom we saw earlier. Tino eventually shows Spain and Terry to their room. Tino gives them a quick tour, and then Spain gives Tino a $50 tip which is pretty sizable. Tino, eager to get more money, says, Thank you very much, sir. My name's Tino, and if there's anything else you need, let me know. Spain gives Tino another $50 and says, Why don't you get my ride washed and detailed? Tino is happy to oblige. Spain jokes, talking to his assistant, Terry. Hey, Terry, you think I can trust this guy? Terry asks Tino, You got a criminal record? Tino answers, No, sir. Terry then says, Then you can't trust him. Somehow Tino not having a record is a bad sign to these people? Tino argues, I only don't have a record because I'm too smart for 5-0. Spain asks Tino the bellboy, does he have a connect for some drugs? Terry can't believe that Spain is already asking this kid for drugs. He says, Jesus Christ, we just met this kid. Tino assures Spain that he can score him whatever drugs he needs. Elsewhere in the hotel, we see that Megan has finally made her way to the pool. She is lounging on a beach chair poolside when all of a sudden, Cole Burns exits the water. Megan is a little nervous and scared when she sees Cole, a Minuteman, in front of her. She comments, oh my god. But Cole tells her, be cool, Miss Dietrich. I ain't packing heat. Megan warns Cole, do you really think you can kill me here in broad daylight with all these witnesses and get away with it? Cole tells her, without breaking a sweat or too many necks, if that was what I was here to do. Megan asks, well then why are you here? Cole warns, why? Because Megan, your life is in danger. Elsewhere, later on, Tino the bellboy, trying to score Spain some drugs, goes to meet a drug dealer named Bosco. Tino actually has some history with this Bosco guy. See, Tino was dating a girl named Pearl, and he even had a kid with Pearl, a son named Miguel. Although Pearl kind of dumped Tino and ended up hooking up with this drug dealer Bosco. And now, Pearl is kind of neglecting their son too, and is sucked into this Bosco's world. Despite all of this complicated history though, 
and the fact that Tino does not really like this Bosco guy and Bosco does not really like Tino. The fact is, Bosco is a good source for drugs, so Tino is going to go to him. Tino, in front of Bosco, asks him, I need to score. He gives Bosco some money. Bosco questions, Yo, there's a million motherfuckers in this town that could hook you up, and you come to me. Why is that, I wonder? Tino answers, Because you're the one out of these million here that has the best shit. Bosco to this says, True dad, true dad, true dad. Alright, get naked. Tino questions, Huh? Bosco insists, Do what I say. So Tino strips naked and one of Bosco's men inspects Tino and notices that he's not wearing a wire. Tino naked is holding his junk, but Bosco tells him, Hey, move those hands away from that dick. Once Tino does, Bosco mocks him saying, oh, Look at the no size of that thing. No wonder you ditched this guy, Pearl. Tino's ex-girlfriend, Pearl, the one that left him for Bosco, is there in the room and here this Bosco is emasculating Tino in front of her. Bosco, he gets up to go grab the drugs that Tino wants. And while Tino is waiting, holding his junk, he talks to his ex saying, How you doing, Pearl? Pearl answers, I'm good. Tino asks about their son. And Miguel? Pearl answers, He's fine. He's with my mama. Tino replies, that's not good, or fine, he belongs with us. Pearl responds, Tino, we don't belong together. Before they can talk further, Bosco returns with the drugs. He throws Tino what he asked for, and then ushers him out. Elsewhere in Miami, down by a horse racing track, Branch, ever the degenerate gambler, is there gambling on some horses. Whatever race he was watching, he seems to have won. In the back stables, we see Augustus Medici with his son, Benito. They are looking at the horses. Benito asks, what are we doing here? Augustus answered, we have a horse running. I wanted to see him before the race. Benito curious asks, what are the stakes? Benito looks in the race guide book to see what the odds are. He asks, is this the race at one o'clock? Odds don't look so good, dad. You mind if I bet? Augustus tells the son, no. Go ahead. Benito, you're not going to bet against him, are you? Augustus is then petting the horse that he seems to be interested in. Benito leaves, and all of a sudden, Agent Graves arrives. Augustus asks, What do you think? Does the horse have a chance? Graves answers, Well, the odds are against him, Augustus. Augustus to this replies, Odds, what are they worth when the field isn't even? Graves to this responds, Nothing, nothing at all, unless you're the house, and only a fool bets against the house. Augustus asks, Honestly, do you think he has a chance? Graves to this says, Like I said, though the odds are against him, the smart money isn't. 100 Bullets, Issue 61, Staring at the Sun, Part 2 of 4. The bellboy Tino goes to see his son Miguel. Miguel is currently staying with Pearl's mom. When Tino sees his boy, he's surprised. Pearl didn't even tell him that Miguel was walking. Pearl's mom explains, How would she know? She hasn't been here in two weeks. Disgraceful, her and that guy she's taken up with. I told her not to come around here anymore. Not with him. What would my neighbors think of me? Tino, hopeful, says, well, maybe soon she'll come around with me again. Pearl's mom doesn't believe that that's going to happen. She says, Tino, that would make me happy, but it's not going to happen. Don't waste your love on Pearl because she has no love for you or any man of any age. Elsewhere, we see Branch. He is in a hotel room. He gets a phone call from Megan Dietrich. Megan finally wants to arrange their meeting time. She says, I'll be ready to meet with you at, say, 10 o'clock. Megan wants to meet Branch in her hotel suite. But Branch, he would rather meet somewhere neutral, somewhere that he is more comfortable with. Megan complains, but eventually Branch convinces her. He says, you had me fly across the ocean. All I'm asking for is for you to walk a few city blocks. Branch tells Megan the place he wants to meet her is a club called Deuce on 14th Street. If she gets lost, she can ask any guy who asks for change directions. Branch then hangs up the phone, so him and Megan are going to 
supposedly meet later on that night. Branch then gets a visitor in his hotel room. It is Cole Burns. And Megan, she too gets a visitor at her hotel room. It is Benito Medici. In another hotel room, Tino is with Spain. They are smoking some drugs. Spain comments, This is good shit, Tino. Spain offers Tino to give it a hit. Tino says he can't, he's got a kid. Spain asks, well, can you drink? Tino says, sure, I can drink. Spain then wonders, well, where is the best place to do it? Tino suggests the bar in the hotel here is pretty nice, but Spain, he wants somewhere more interesting, somewhere he can get laid. He says, nice, fuck nice. I want a screw, I want sweaty tits and ass and cocoa butter cooch and painted toenails. That's what this town's about, ain't it? Tino says he has a place in mind. Spain's happy to hear that, although he wants Tino to change out of his outfit. He doesn't want him being dressed as a bellboy as they go to a nightclub. Tino asks, what about your boy Terry there? Is he going to come with us? Spain's assistant slash lawyer Terry is sleeping on a bed. Spain says, eh, let's just leave him for now. He'll ring me up once he wakes up. I should leave him a little something for his head, though, when he does come through. Spain leaves a joint by Terry for him to enjoy once he rises from his sleep. Now, it is still a few hours away until Megan and Mr. Branch are supposed to meet up. So for now, Megan and Benito are hanging out, and they walk over to a posh nightclub. Meanwhile, Mr. Branch is at the sketchy Club Deuce with Cole Burns, and they are drinking at the bar and talking. Over in the more posh nightclub with Megan and Benito, they are joined by Spain and Tino, who have also entered the club. Spain and Tino head to the bar. Spain is scoping out the lady situation in this place. He's liking what he sees. Tino tells him, I told you, Spain, I could hook you up. A lot of models come here. Spain replies, Ah, eh, screw that breed of skank. They behave like porn stars till it's time to get down to some porn. Models suck. Who you want to go after is girls that wanna be models. Check it. Spain walks over to a somewhat attractive girl and asks her, Say, mama, let me get you a drink. The woman who's already holding a drink says, I already have one. Spain then tickles her and she drops her drink to the ground. Once she does that, she eventually tells Spain the order of drink she wants. Meanwhile, back in Spain's hotel room, Spain's dog, Cookie, is licking Spain's assistant, Terry's face. This causes Terry to finally wake up. Terry finds the joint that Spain left him. He then goes to the bathroom to pee and take a bath. Afterwards, he's planning on smoking the joint. Back over to the club where Megan, Benito, Spain, and Tino are. All of a sudden, some new people enter the club. It is Tino's ex-girlfriend, Pearl, and the drug dealer, Bosco. After a few minutes in the club, eventually Bosco and his boys notice Tino. And Tino notices Bosco as well. Tino, when he sees Bosco, comments, Shit. Spain overhears this and asks Tino, What? What is it? Tino tries to downplay it, saying, ah, it's nothing, it's nothing. Spain insists that Tino tells him what's going on. Tino eventually points out Bosco in the club here. He's the guy with the braids. Tino explains, and that girl beside him? That's my girl with him. Spain can't believe this, he says. The mother of your child? That's messed up. Spain excuses himself, and he starts walking towards Bosco. Tino getting nervous says, what are you going to do, Spain? Spain replies, I'm going to fuck that motherfucker up. Bosco sees Tino and this Spain guy heading towards him. Pearl tells her man, don't mess with him, Bosco. Bosco replies, chill, Pearl. I ain't going to mess with your baby daddy again. Spain, he just walks right up to Bosco and with his hand ornamented with various rings, he punches Bosco right in his face unexpectedly. Meanwhile, back at the hotel, that joint that Spain's assistant Terry hit earlier? Well, it turns out it was laced with PCP, and he started tripping balls. At this moment, it is not clear what happened, but 
Terry is covered with blood and he is walking through the halls crazed. 100 Bullets Issue 62 Staring at the Sun Part 3 of 4 Cole and Branch are continuing to drink, and they actually seem to develop a kind of a friendship. Cole is teasing Branch a bit, saying, Would you lighten up, fat boy? Branch replies, Would you mind calling me Branch for once? Cole to this says, I have a hard time with that. You don't look like a branch. I mean, you're more of a stump. <laughs> and they share a good laugh and order another round of drinks. Back over at the nightclub, Spain gets tossed out for punching Bosco in the face. The bouncers warn Spain, you're lucky you're not phoning the cops, asswipe. Later on that night, Benito and Megan join Augustus for dinner that he made himself. Megan shares that she saw Cole Burns earlier and they exchanged some words. Cole told her that the families in the trust are conspiring against Augustus and that he made it clear the Minutemen are still needed. Benito theorizes that maybe Cole was trying to win Megan over to his side of things. We jump back over to Spain and Tino. They walk back from the club that they got kicked out of to the hotel. When they arrive at the hotel, they are a little suspicious. There are cops outside. It doesn't seem normal. All of a sudden, Spain sees his associate, Terry, foaming from the mouth and on a stretcher. He is being taken away in an ambulance. Spain starts getting worried. He asks Tino to go figure out what went down. Since Tino works at the hotel, he'll have a better grasp on getting information. In Spain, he has to lay low until he knows the coast is clear. If he shows up, maybe the cops will arrest him for whatever happened to Terry. Before Tino and Spain separate, Spain asks Tino where's a good bar he can go to, just a regular joint, not one of these fancy South Beach places. Tino tells him Club Deuce, just down on 14th Street. Spain says he'll see Tino there later. We jump over to Bosco, he has returned to his crib. He is pissed. He just got punched in the face, sucker punched, by this random guy, Spain, he doesn't even know. Bosco then tells one of his associates, Jay, to go and get him his blade. Jay disappears into the next room and then he comes back with a samurai sword. Jay gives the sword to Bosco and Bosco unsheaths the blade. And then he says, I'm gonna cut that guy up in the chunks. His own mother won't recognize him. They then leave their crib to go search out Spain, so Bosco can get some revenge. Back over to Club Deuce, Cole and Branch continue drinking. Branch comments, I always knew that coming back to the States would mean the death of me. Cole replies, It ain't where, but how you die what counts for shit, stump. Branch, he laughs and says, <laughs> Goddamn Stockholm Syndrome, I'm actually starting to like you. As they continue talking, all of a sudden, Spain enters Club Deuce and sits beside them at the bar. Cole eventually shows Mr. Branch a picture of Echo Memoria. Cole explains that her name is Echo and she was behind the thievery of a real work of art. And she stole it not once, but twice. Branch comments that she looks familiar. Cole continues and says that Echo's running with Lano. Remember him? This painting she stole, there are a lot of folks that would like to get their hands on it. Branch asks, like who? Cole says, like me for one. Branch continues studying the picture of Echo, and then he eventually recognizes her. He says that he had sex with her back at his place in Paris. This was something we saw way back in issue 26 in the Mr. Branch in the Family Tree story arc. Branch just thought Echo was some sort of common street prostitute, but it seemed like Echo had ulterior motivations when she was with him. Spain, overhearing this conversation, asks Branch, Was she any good? Branch answers, I lasted 30 seconds. Tops. All of a sudden, Tino enters Club Deuce and he finds Spain, and they go outside to talk, so Tino can fill in Spain on what he's learned. Once they get outside, Tino explains that Terry went crazy. He was rampaging through the halls all naked. It took hotel security plus six cops to bring him down. He was super high. 
higher than a kite, totally dusted. Spain asks PCP. Terry wouldn't touch that shit. Then all of a sudden, Spain realizes that it must have been the drugs that Tino got for them earlier. Spain grows angry and starts choking Tino. Tino pleads that he didn't know. Tino then explains that the guy that Spain punched earlier, the drug dealer Bosco, that was who he got the drugs from. Spain then asks, did the cops go to his room? Did they find any of my drugs? Tino answers, yeah. Spain asks, is there anything else? Tino answers, yeah. Terry, he, uh, he was so high, he, uh, ate your dog. Spain shocked says, he what? He ate cookie? Spain lets Tino go and stops choking him. Back inside Club Deuce. Branch, starting to feel sick from all the alcohol, goes into the bathroom to do some vomiting. Cole is with him. Cole explains that he wants Branch to go and find Echo for him. She's back in Europe. Branch, he questions, why me? Cole answers, because I said so, stump. 100 Bullets, Issue 63, Staring at the Sun, Part 4 of 4. Spain gets in a car with Tino. He wants Tino to take him to the drug dealer that gave them the bad drugs, the one that led to the death of his friend and his dog. Elsewhere, over to Augustus Medici's home, Megan and Benito are all having drinks. They discuss how some of the other families in the trust are against Augustus and may try to move against the house of Medici. Augustus asks if Megan will be allied with him, and she says she will. Benito starts chiming into their conversation, but Augustus cuts him off and says, You're not ready. I can't let you be a part of this. Benito is upset. He says, Why? I've done everything you've asked me to. Augustus answers, And I'm asking you to stay out of this. It seems like Augustus is just trying to save his son from the ugly business of war. Benito leaves the room and Augustus and Megan talk further. Over by a beach, Mr. Branch and Cole Burns are walking and talking. They discuss the La Morte del Cesar painting, the one that was all the rage in the Counter Fifth Detective story arc. Cole, he wants the painting and he wants Branch to help him get it by finding Echo Memoria. Branch asks, why do you even want it? Cole answers, look, as far as I'm concerned, the only thing special about the painting are the people that want it, and me, if I have it. Plus, I'd like to join your club on people that got to sleep with Echo Memoria. Branch, he's still skeptical, but Cole pushes him, saying, Look, the way I see it, Stump, we got no choice. The die's been cast, and so have our roles. All we can do is play the odds. I've never been one to bet against myself, and my gut tells me, neither are you. Even if I wasn't bringing you in on the game, just the fact that you are what you are and knowing what you know means no ain't an option. As they are walking, we see in a car, the drug dealer Bosco with his samurai sword is driving about, looking for Tino. Back over to Bosco's apartment, Tino and Spain have arrived. They have came here for revenge on Bosco. They break inside. Only they do not find Bosco or any of his men as they are all out looking for them. What instead they do find is Tino's ex-girlfriend Pearl and their son Miguel. Spain pushes his way in and starts swinging around his gun. Elsewhere, back at Augustus's home, his meeting with Megan has ended and Augustus asks his son Benito and his bodyguard Crete to please take Megan back to her hotel. Once they all leave, Agent Graves is there. He was hiding in the shadows. Graves tells Augustus, It wasn't too long ago that boy of yours would have told you to screw off after shutting him out like you did. The two of them then go to share a drink at Augustus's bar. They discuss the oncoming war in the trust. Graves warns Augustus, I've came here, Augustus, to give you one last chance to change the plans. Augustus answers, You mean to temper my metal? Philip, we both understand what's at stake, while maybe no one else really does. The plans. What makes you imagine I'd want to change them? Back over to Bosco's apartment. Spain has made Pearl take off her clothes, 
Then Spain starts looking around, trying to find any interesting booze he can drink or any other valuables he can take. Meanwhile, Tino talks to Pearl. He asks, Why is Miguel here? Why isn't your mother watching him? Pearl says that her Aunt Lita had a stroke and her mom had to deal with that, so she had to watch the boy. Tino then feels bad that Pearl had to strip down out of her clothes. He tells Spain, Spain, this ain't right. Pearl didn't do shit. Spain disagrees, though. He says, no? She screwed you over after you slept with her and gave her a baby. That is shit, man. Frickin' A it is. Have you had sex with her since? Tino doesn't answer, but he looks down, insinuating the answer is no. Spain continues, well, that's a big frickin' no. So screw her. She owes you. Spain then demands that Tino have sex with Pearl right here and now. Tino, he's not interested in this. He says, uh, I can't. Uh, my boy is here. Spain grabs Miguel and says, I ain't making you shy. My old man never had that problem. Spain takes Miguel and then tells Tino to give it to her. Tino, he feels really uncomfortable doing this, but he removes his pants. He's down to his underwear now. Pearl says, you can't do this to me, Tino. Spain, he jumps in saying, sure he can. Right, T? Tino tells Pearl, the last time I was here, I watched how you took care of Bosco. Spain, all of a sudden, hearing the name Bosco, spits out his drink. He says, who? Spain, he knows this Bosco guy. Or at least his name and reputation, anyway. All of a sudden, at that moment, Bosco finally returns home. He comes into the room and he sees Tino with his pants down, Pearl naked, and Spain there. Bosco comments, what the hell? Bosco instinctually grabs his gun and he shoots Tino in his thigh. Tino, he then shouts out, kill him, Spain. All of a sudden, Bosco, hearing the name Spain, recognizes it as well. Everyone is in the middle of a standoff. Spain pointing his gun, Bosco's boys pointing two guns back, Tino bleeding out on the floor, Pearl sitting on a beanbag, and Bosco on the couch with his dog. Bosco and Spain both work out their mutual misunderstandings with one another and how they were supposed to be doing business together. After some brief conversation, Bosco adds, All right, so we're square, right? Spain, he thinks on it, and then he shoots and kills Bosco's dog, just like his own dog died. Spain then says, Yeah, we are now. This obviously pisses Bosco off, though. He pulls out his samurai sword and he slices Spain's head off. As Spain is decapitated, he still has that oozy gun in his hand. And he holds down on the trigger and starts spraying bullets. And he manages to spray through everyone in the room. Including Bosco, Pearl, and the two men that Bosco had with him. In the aftermath, everyone is dead except the little boy, Miguel. He crawls over to his dead mom on the beanbag chair and tries to pull her arm. What a delightful turn of events. <laughs> we jump over to Club Deuce. Megan is there with Crete and Benito. Megan is here to meet with Mr. Branch. This was the meeting time and place they were supposed to talk at. But Mr. Branch he never arrived. He ended up going to the airport on Cole Burns' orders. When Branch is at the airport, he has a picture of Echo Memoria in his hands. He is waiting for his flight and he is thinking about how is he going to track Echo down when he arrives back in Europe? How is he going to find this painting that Cole Burns wants him to find? While he is waiting in the airport though, a black woman walks by and she reminds Branch of Dizzy. Branch, he became a little infatuated with Dizzy over the short period of time he spent with her in Paris. He's thought about her many days since. He's worried about her and if she's going to make it out of this messy situation with Graves and Shepard and the Trust and the Minuteman alive. Branch, he contemplates his flight some more and then he decides, no, he's not going to go to Europe. He's not going to do what Cole Burns wants him to do. He's going to stay here in the States and try and find Dizzy himself. 100 Bullets, Issue 64, The Dive In this issue, we are picking back with Minuteman, Jack Daw. The last time we saw Jack was in the Instinct story arc, which ended in Issue 49. At the end of that issue, Jack 
he decided to finally go clean and stop using drugs. And he was going to head to Atlantic City. Because it's a town full of losers and he will fit right in, according to Jack's own words. When we see Jack in this issue, he is in a bare knuckle boxing fight. It seems like he is getting the shit beat out of him, but Jack really is in control of the situation. A whole bunch of people are gambling on the fight that Jack is in. Some of the people in the crowd are impressed with Jack's ability to withstand punishment. They just saw Jack get punched in the head multiple times and they say, I don't get it, how is he still standing? All of a sudden in the crowd, Agent Graves arrives. He is here to watch the fight, too. Another man in the crowd yells out how Jack's getting his ass kicked, but another gambler comments, you boys bet against the jackhammer? <laughs> you gonna take a beating worse than him. I'm telling you, I ain't ever seen a fella bare knuckle take the punches like this one does, yet still pound it out. The hammer don't lose. The gambler that's against Jack says, eh, they all lose sooner or later. Odds being against it, my money says it's gonna be tonight. But the gambler that's all for Jack says, eh, then your money's about to be someone else's. Like I said, he can take the punches. His head's a goddamn rock. Agent Graves chimes in and adds, One thing I've learned is, it's dangerous to bet on a man with a hard head. That kind of man only sees his own past, blind to any threats a new situation presents. A hard head is a soft shit. Now give me a hard heart, and I'll back it every day of the week. Jack, noticing Graves in the crowd, decides to end the fight. He all of a sudden punches his opponent in the stomach, and then his face, and knocks him down. After the fight, Jack collects his money, and then he is approached by Agent Graves. Graves comments to Jack, That's quite an exhibition you put on tonight. Jack replies, Didn't last as long as I'd liked it to. Another round, maybe some real money would have been thrown in, and I'd have picked up a nice payday. But... I had to end it, for two reasons. One, that fat punk couldn't put me down all night if he had six arms. And two, because I saw you in the crowd. The shit you gave me, Agent Graves? Well, I'm giving it back. I don't need it. Jack tries to hand the attache briefcase back to Graves. Graves tells Jack, I don't want it back. Jack, he then explains that he kicked the drugs he's not using anymore. Graves replies, so now you punch people. Or maybe more appropriately, you're looking for the same series of punches that has the same kick I gave you. That means you haven't really changed, Jack. You're still a pussy. Previously you wanted drugs, and now someone's fists to do what you can't do. Finally, end it. Jack, he looks like he's gonna hit Graves, but Graves, he stands tall. And then right in Jack's face, he calls him a passive, aggressive pussy. Do you want to die, Jack? I gave you 100 chances to get that job done. You want to live? Then stop pretending you don't. Graves, he then leaves Jack and heads to a bar. At the bar, Graves orders some vodka to drink down. Jack follows Graves into the bar. A bouncer in the bar notices Jack and tells him, Oh, you can't come in here looking like that. Jack's all bruised and bloodied. Jack tells the man, Like you're about to do anything about it. Jack, he then goes over to Graves and says, Old man, I said I don't need this anymore. He tries to give Graves the attaché back. Graves replies, Really? Well, what I said I meant, I won't take it back. Jack holds Graves and tells him, I can make you. Graves responds, No, you can't. The bouncer, he then tries to attack Jack with a baton. Jack grabs the baton out of the man's hands when he tries to swing at him, and then Jack headbutts the man, taking him down. The female bartender there gets scared. She grabs the phone and phones 911. Jack, though, he pulls out the gun that Graves gave him and he shoots the phone. Jack then points the gun to the bouncer he laid out on the floor. Jack threatens to shoot the man. Graves asks him, Is that why you want me to take it back, Jack? Jack continues threatening to shoot the man. He begins counting down from 10. Graves, he responds, 10. Your body count is a lot higher than that though, isn't it, Jack? The female bartender freaking out pleads with Graves and says, Please, mister, for the love of God, just take whatever it is back. Jack, still threatening to shoot the man, says, You heard the lady, Graves. Take it back. Graves, he just stays silent. 
Jack then yells, Take it back! Graves he continues to stay silent, and then he just says, Passive, aggressive, pussy. Jackie then shoots the gun, although he purposely misses the man. He just shot the gun to scare everyone. Jack opens the attache. He takes the picture of himself out of it, and he hands it to Graves. Graves, he throws the picture in the air, and Jack, he then begins shooting the picture. He fires four bullets into the photo while it's flying in the air. Jack, he then continues to stare down Graves. But, since Graves isn't budging on taking this thing back, Jack, he ends up packing up the attache, and he leaves the bar with it. And while Graves is still sitting in that bar, he drinks his vodka and he comments to himself, Pussy. 100 Bullets, Issue 65, New Tricks, Part 1 of 2. Loop and Victor Ray are waiting in a strip club while Lano attends to some business. We see Lano in some sort of abandoned maintenance room. He is torturing Fulvio Carlito, the head of the Carlito family. If you remember way back to issue 39 in the Ambitions Audition one-shot story arc, there was an attempted hit on Augustus Medici and his son, Benito. Well, it turns out that Fulvio Carlito was the person that hired the men that did that hit. And now, Lana was torturing him to try and get some answers. Fulvio is hanging upside down from the ceiling, suspended by chains. His mouth and hands are taped up. Lano is beating him, punching him in the stomach, cutting off his fingers. Fulvio says that he acted alone, but Lano knows that is not true. Lano tells him, Why you want to lie to me, Fulvio? I mean, sure, the botched hit on Medici and Little Havana was yours. No question, it was classic House of Carlito. The underpay for overkill, so the only dead are the rummies you owe money to. It has... No point, but it sends a message, which is what you're all about. Trouble with that one is, those rummies, when they saw their primary target was untouchable, moved on to a secondary, Benito. And you ain't about that. We both goddamn know you ain't got the balls. Or do you? Let's find out. Lano then with a knife, works his way up to Fulvio's genitals, and he cuts his balls off. Lano then sits and watches as blood is pouring down Fulvio. Lano eventually says, So you did have balls, Fulvio. Now unless you're ready to lose your cock, tell me who was working with you on that little Havana job. Fulvio, he is now compliant. He screams out who his accomplices were. He says, It was Helena Cotius. Lano replies, Uh-huh, uh-huh. If it was Helena, then Javier Vasco is in it too. She wouldn't take a shit. He didn't squeeze it out of her. A callback to another issue now, issue 41, A Crash. That was the one-shot issue where Graves had a meeting with three members of the Trust, Javier Vasco, Fulvio Carlito, and Helena Cotius. In that issue, they were telling Graves how they were conspiring to take Augustus down. Well, Lano has the information he needs now. He knows who was responsible for the attempted hit on Augustus. Lano tells Fulvio, What the hell were you thinking? The House of Codius might as well be a wing on the House of Asco as far as the trust is concerned. As for the House of Carlito, well, you thrown in with them means it's about to go on the market. Lano is basically saying that he's going to kill Fulvio. Fulvio says that he has heirs though. They'll take his place when he's gone. Lano continues torturing and cutting up Fulvio. Fulvio eventually screams, Ah! We had, a, we had a deal with Graves. Lano listens and says, Now you have to deal with me. And for that matter, Graves does too. You contracted to hit out on Augustus Medici. And when that didn't work, your hired help went after his son. This makes the trust even. Lano in a little shopping bag dumps out two decapitated heads. The children or the heirs of Fulvio Carlito. Fulvio, seeing the heads of his son, screams out, No! No! Eventually, Lano finishes Fulvio off, and then he gives Victor and Loop a call. 
100 Bullets, Issue 66, New Tricks, Part 2 of 2. Before we continue on with this issue, let's update our character breakdown sheet here with another death, symbolized by a red X through Fulvio Carlito in the House of Carlito. When this issue picks up, Lano is having a meeting with Augustus Modici. Augustus asks if Lano finished taking care of Fulvio. Lano says, he did. Fulvio's dead, and his children are dead. Dead, dead, dead. The house of Carlito is empty. Move in and take the rest of the houses with you. All of them. Augustus asks if he acted alone. Lano answers, no. Augustus replies, so as Minutemen, your job is to... Lano cuts him off and says, as your warlord, my job is now to make peace. There are no Minutemen anymore to settle the trust's disputes. There's just me. Augustus answers, I need a warlord, not a warrior. Lano to this says, oh, I got soldiers, but I could use some more. Hey, Crete, you feel like getting your hands dirty? Or you content with no one knowing what those big mitts of yours can do? Augustus' bodyguard, Crete, answers, I'm content knowing Mr. Medici is safe, Mr. Lano. Lano replies, oh yeah? What makes him so safe? Crete answers, I do. Lano to this says, bullshit, I can reach right across this table and... Crete, he then grabs Lano's wrist and stops him. Things almost escalate into violence, but Augustus calms the situation down. He says, Crete, I think Lano was just trying to prove a point. Augustus then comments how Graves is still out there. Lano to this says, where he belongs, and who frickin' cares who he's got with him. Augustus answers, I can think of ten families that might care. Lano replies, well, I can think of ten who won't if you forgive two. Lano seems to be trying to push Augustus into forming a peace, and that peace would be formed as long as he could forgive Javier Vasco and Helena Cotius for their involvement in the potential assassination of Augustus. Augustus questions forgive. An attempt was made not only on my life, but my son's. Those responsible should be dead. Lano answers, wrong. Under the old rules, you had every right, and me the responsibility, to take out Cotius and Vasco, no question. But under the new rules that you set up, doesn't it make more sense if we play by him? If you really want the trust to really believe in your vision of the future, you will leave those two alive and make a real big man move. Do it at a sit down in front of all the families. As for Carlito, hell, not one of the other families will fault you for taking him out. And if they do, you tell them that it was me who went too far with his ass. Augustus thinking about what Lano said, eventually replies, Shepard was right about you. I'll be in touch. Now, at the exact same time as this meeting between Lano and Augustus was happening, somewhere else, Megan Dietrich goes to a nice restaurant. She enters that restaurant in a fine-looking dress. She sits down at a table. She has a team of six bodyguards with her. Loop, he is already in that restaurant. He was waiting for Megan to arrive. Loop and Victor have a mission they are on for Lano. When Loop sees Megan enter, he gives Victor a phone call on a cell phone and tells him, Yo Vic, she's here. Victor tells Loop, Alright, you make sure that you do exactly what we talked about. Exactly. Loop says he will, and he hangs up. Victor eventually manages to sneak into the restaurant through the back alley, near where they bring out the garbage. Loop, he orders his food. Victor, he hides in the back near the kitchen. Loop sitting at a table in the restaurant is drinking some water, and he's constantly keeping his eye on Megan. Eventually, the waiter returns from the kitchen with Loop's food. As the waiter approaches Loop's table, Loop trips the waiter, and the waiter drops the food to the floor, causing a loud ruckus and a distraction. While all of Megan's bodyguards are eyeing the waiter, all of a sudden, from the double doors in the kitchen, Victor, with a silencer on his pistol, shoots at Megan. The bullet goes right through Megan's menu, and it hits her right in the chest. Megan falls down to the ground. 
Vic and Loop managed to get away. And eventually, as Lano ended his meeting with Augustus, he got a text from Vic saying, It's done. 100 Bullets, Issue 67, Love Let Her Dizzy and wily times have traveled to a secluded place in the Mexican desert to lie low. They were aided in their disappearance and their ability to live off the grid thanks to the help of Mick Kuchenko, a.k.a. Kuchi. He was the sketchy guy that got stuff across the border that we met way back in Issue 30 in the Contrabandolero story arc. Eventually, separately, Benito Mendici and Mr. Branch, both infatuated by Dizzy, both of them in a way feeling they love her in the brief times they met her in the past, that they separately have traveled to Mexico to try and find her. Eventually, Benito finds this Coochie guy. He asks him about Dizzy, and Benito offers to pay Coochie a lot of money if he will bring him to her, and Coochie will oblige. As they are walking through the small Mexican town, all of a sudden, just by happenstance, Mr. Branch is there too, and he happens to have a picture of Dizzy that he is looking at. Benito and Coochie notice this. They kidnap Branch and drive into the desert, and then they question him. Coochie asks, Where do you get this picture? Branch answers, I'm the one that took the photo. Well, they decide to take Branch with them, and Coochie drives both Benito and Branch to where Dizzy and Wiley are staying. Benito pays Coochie off and he leaves, and at the end of the issue, Dizzy, Wiley, Benito, and Branch are all in the desert together. And that is how we end things for 100 Bullets, Volume 9. All right, so that was Volume 9 of 100 Bullets. Let me go through my thoughts on the various story arcs in this one. And I got some interesting thoughts on this one, I think. So, the first issue, issue 59, The Calm. I liked having Victor Ray team up with Lano and Loop. And the team building going on, and uh, them coming together. And uh, it will be interesting to see them in the future going forward. I will say, though, it's kind of interesting how a lot of these Minutemen characters are kind of bad guys. They're really morally great. Lano is a jerk, and he's trying to rape girls all the time, and he's not a good guy. And Victor Ray, he was hooking up with this girl, and he just dismisses her like she is nothing. And her husband comes back and almost kills her, and Victor could care less. So, uh, you know, Victor did not come off good in this issue as well. Although, I think that is maybe the point. They are supposed to be kind of bad guys, and people we don't fully root for. So it was interesting, although I felt a little dirty coming off of that issue and, uh, and how uh, it all went down. The next story arc, the four-issue Staring at the Sun one, I thought it was interesting how the main thrust of that story arc was following this Tino character. Tino and Spain and the drug dealer Bosco, and those characters do not matter <laughs> in the sense of the overall 100 Bullet story. They are just some side characters we're following for a few issues, and then they are gone, all dead at the end of this story arc. So, kind of interesting how we focus on these side characters and tell these long story arcs with them, even though they're not that important to the overall thrust of the narrative. So, very interesting. I liked the Tino storyline, uh, a, lot, a lot of parts of it. I liked him hanging out with Spain and seeing their little adventure and the hotels and seedy bars um, down there. So that was pretty cool. Now, the ending, though, I don't know if I love it, how everyone just dies. I don't know. And also, Spain and Bosco, the sort of twist there where I guess they knew each other, but they didn't know each other's faces when they saw each other earlier. But when they heard each other's names, all of a sudden they realized that, oh, shit. We were supposed to do business together, and then they try to come to a peace or something there. I didn't love that twist, but uh, I thought it was interesting seeing their escalation and their little battling going on. Bosco with his sword and Spain killing everyone. Anyway, very interesting story arc there. <laughs> uh, beyond the Tino side plot, we had sort of the furthering of the narrative with the trust, seeing Augustus and Megan talk, and uh, Benito tied in there as well. 
and coal burns and graves. So yeah, lots of stuff going on in that story arc. Now, after staring at the sun, we have the one issue, the dive story arc, which I really liked. I like seeing Jack as this bare knuckle boxer fighter fighting for money on the streets and then Graves meeting him and Graves just standing up to Jack, calling him a passive aggressive pussy to his face. Graves is just such a badass. He's this old man and I am pretty sure Jack could beat his ass if he wanted to, but Graves ain't scared and he is just staring Jack down and trying to almost push him to change his ways. And I really loved their little confrontation in this issue. Uh, and I thought it helped uh, elevate Jack's storyline along. So uh, good stuff here. The next story arc, New Tricks. That is where we had uh, Lano torturing and killing Falvio Carlito. So uh, we have another death of a member of the Trust, which is intriguing. And the issue after that, we had Augustus having a meeting with Lano. And they talked about some intriguing things that are furthering the overall um, threats and things going on there. And we also had uh, an attack on Megan Dietrich by Victor Ray and Loop, which was intriguing. Uh, we'll see if Megan is actually dead or not in the coming story arcs. And the last issue in this volume, uh, Love Let Her, uh, I thought was not the best. It is really just about uh, Branch, Wiley, and Benito meeting up with Dizzy and them hanging out in the desert there in Mexico. So, um, yeah. Now, I don't fully get why everyone would be so obsessed with Dizzy. So, Wiley was hanging out with Dizzy when she shot Shepard, and I, told, I get why he would maybe stick with her. But uh, Branch, he met Dizzy in Paris for a few days, and he's just so infatuated with her, he's going to drop everything to go and try and find her. I don't know if I'm buying that motivation there. And Benito as well. He met Dizzy maybe once or twice very briefly in past issues, and all of a sudden, he is so infatuated with her, too. He's going to go and try and find her. I don't know if I'm buying that. So I got some problems uh, with that story arc there. But whatever. They're all hanging out. And uh, we'll see them together in the future volumes here. All right. Those are my various thoughts on this volume. Let me know some of your thoughts in the comments. Uh, I'm still going to give this volume an 8 out of 10. I thought it was still uh, pretty exciting. And I love the artwork and uh, the overall story going on here. So uh, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all in the future with Volume 10.